In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O Lord, we thank Thee for the opportunity to gather here to hear Jason Everett. I ask that Thou grant us the grace to make this time fruitful, and may it help us to learn and grow in our faith and spiritual lives. We ask this through Jesus Christ, Thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with Thee, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Jason Everett has spoken to more than one million people about the virtue of chastity. He is a best-selling author of more than ten books, including Theology of the Body for Teens and How to Find Your Soulmate Without Losing Your Soul. Jason earned a master's degree in theology, as well as undergraduate degrees in counseling and theology from Franciscan University of Steubenville. He is a frequent guest on radio programs, and his television appearances include Fox News, the BBC, MSNBC, and EWTN. Everyone, please welcome Jason Everett. Hey, thanks for having me on. Glad to have you. Let's jump straight into the questions. Uh, and before we begin, I just want to let everyone who has submitted a question know that uh, due to time constraints, we have decided to uh, summarize and uh, shorten each of the questions to get at the substantial thing being asked. So apologies if it's not the exact uh, way that you would have phrased it, but uh, these are all the questions you've submitted. So the first question is from Jerma. He asks, what topic of yours do you see people having the most difficulty with? Um, I mean, one of the presentations I've been giving more recently is the subject of gender. Uh, I've been speaking at a lot of universities about the subject. And uh, for a lot of, I think, young people in particular, they've been led to believe that, uh, you know, there's basically two routes you can have. You can either have the gender affirmative position, which really uh, saves the young person who's experiencing the distress of gender dysphoria from any more suffering and prevents suicide and lets them be their authentic self by just affirming their innate sense of gender identity. Or, you know, you can be kind of a heartless, transphobic bigot who's just a hate-monging, religious, right-wing fanatic who doesn't care about anybody but yourself. And if that's like the cultural script or narrative that's put forth to young people, you know, you can either accept these people or abandon them. You know, you can either affirm them or reject them. Uh, most young people in this generation are pretty sensitive to, to bullying and ostracizing, and they think, well, I don't, I don't want to be a jerk about it. So, yeah, I'm not really deeply convicted by the tenets of gender theory, but I don't want to be a jerk. So, yeah, you know, you be you. Do, do whatever you want. Um, and so what we've got to do in that presentation is really try to break through some of those preconceived expectations that there's, you know, one route of love and compassion and the other route of, like, closed-minded bigotedness. Uh, by, by showing, no, you know, accept or abandon aren't our only two options here. There's something that Pope Francis promotes, which is that of accompaniment, uh, which means walking with the person in love, but also in the truth. Because if you're giving somebody love, but you're not giving them the truth, it's really misguided mercy. And um, so, so I find, you know, it takes a little bit of work to get through um, that initial barrier of thinking um, that if you're trying to encourage someone to uh, reconcile, uh, in a sense, the distress they feel with their biological sex and knowing that God didn't make a mistake in giving them that body, um, once you get through that barrier and really show them that the, the, the approach of truth is actually one of love, um, then I think a lot of progress can be made. But I think culturally there's a lot of resistance to that message just because of the way it's been framed, that you know you either go along with this gender theory narrative or you're just a hateful person. Um, but once you can break through that, I think people can clearly see, well, wait a minute, maybe the most loving approach is not to put these kids on puberty blockers starting at age eight, like they're doing right now, and double mastectomies at 12 years old, like they're doing at Oakland's Children's Hospital. Um, that, that there's a better route to help people to navigate these feelings of dysphoria. Um, and so I think that's, that's one of the topics that's culturally most sensitive. Um, but once you, as I said, once you break through and, and they help you to understand, okay, this person doesn't hate these individuals. He really does care about them. And the research shows that the gender, quote unquote, affirmative approach is actually causing more harm than good. Um, then you can make a lot of progress and changing the way they look at the situation. 
I think what you said about accompaniment uh, is very pertinent and like it, as St. Paul says it best, if I have, even though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have faith that can move mountains, but if I have no charity, I am nothing. So mm -hmm. the idea of charity with truth is very important, I think, and something a lot of people miss, no matter yeah. whether they choose one or the other. Yeah, and if you, if you click on any kind of YouTube video that's talked about gender, it's basically this kind of culture warrior right wing you know scholar type person who's you know the, the title will be you know watch this woke lib trans radical person get destroyed by so and so and th that's the clickbait you know and people see that they click on it they, they want to see a dumpster fire they want to see somebody publicly humiliated and it's really a shame because if you were to put a clip on YouTube, you know, watch this rational dialogue between a person who experiences gender dysphoria and a person who's offering clear explanations of the church's teaching. Like nobody's going to click on it. You know, we, we want to, they say in journalism, if it bleeds, it leads. And it's really unfortunate because the algorithms really reward, you know, the edgy content, uh, which makes a lot of people think that there's just these two extreme positions that are battling it out when in reality most of us don't live in either one of those extreme camps amen next question is from gebs considering the normalization of sexual immorality in our time do you have any suggestions or advice on how to approach the talk about chastity and the beauty of sexual relationships within marriage with our future children yeah, well, I like the fact that you use the word beauty there, because I think when it comes to the transcendentals of, you know, what is true and what is good and what is beautiful, we, we tend to lead in with what's true. You know, this is what the church teaches and then why it's good. And that's why you should do it because it's not evil. Oh, and then by the way, it's beautiful. I think we need to flip the order of those and the way that we present the church's teachings so that we're leading in with beauty because you can argue with what's true. You can argue with what's good, um, but beauty, you can't really argue with that. I mean, beauty is irrefutable. Um, and, and so I think we need to kind of lean in there in, in terms of starting with why the church's teaching is beautiful and it's really what you long for. It's what you ache for. I mean, even a big study that was done not too long ago on college students in the hookup culture asked them, like, what would you rather have, a, a hookup or a traditional romantic relationship? And the vast majority of college males as well as females, they would, they would much prefer to have a traditional romantic relationship. But unfortunately, they were twice as likely to hook up as they were to even go on a first date. And so I think when it comes to presenting this message to young people, it's lead in with why this church teaching is beautiful and why chastity frees you to love and why it frees you to know if you're authentically being loved. Because John Paul II said, we, chastity can only be thought of in association with the virtue of love. If we're not making that connection clear in their minds, and we're just trying to use scare tactics, or you're going to get pregnant and die of an STD and go to hell. I mean, it'll freak them out for 10 or 15 minutes and they're back at it. Because the way the young person's brain works is when it makes a behavioral decision, it bases it primarily on the potential of positive rewards, not the potential of negative consequences. And so we've got to focus more on the positive than the negative. And then when it comes to the kids, I mean, start obviously with age appropriate stuff, but start young, you know, not necessarily birds and bees stuff. You know, but the gift of the body, when you're changing diapers on little kids, you're not talking about dirty body parts and bad body parts. You know, that's not why they're private, because they're bad. I mean, this kind of creates this neurat neurotic attitude towards our own sexuality. Like, that's a bad body part. That's dirty. And it's like, no, you know, God didn't create some body parts and the devil created the other ones. Like, it, like it's all God's and it's all good. And um, so we just start early building those little building blocks because ultimately it's not about a talk. Like, when do I give my kid the talk? Like, it's some chastity bomb you drop on your kid when they're 12. Um, it's more about a, a conversation that hopefully they can have well into adulthood where you can build that relationship with them instead of just having some big talk and then hoping that's just going to stick. The next question is from Error. How would you advise people who aren't sure what counts as a just reason to use NFP? Do you generally generally lean more strict or lax when it comes to using NFP? Well, I mean, this is something that the church obviously doesn't give us a number in, in terms of how many kids to have. It really opens it to the couple's discernment, trusting that you guys are praying about this, you're talking about this, and if you're not in a state of 
clarity that you could find a good spiritual director and, you know, hey, father, you know, do, do you think this is a good enough reason to kind of postpone pregnancy right now? Or do you think we're being kind of overly anxious in, in wanting to control all aspects of our lives and not really trusting much in the providence of God? Uh, because sometimes that's what's at stake. We're not really trusting God. At other times, you know, couples can look at it and be like, okay, yeah, financially, we could probably afford another kid right now. But like, psychologically, mentally, you know, my wife is, you know, really fried right now and she's burnt out and she's stressed out. And if we were to add another pregnancy right now, it, it would really be very taxing on her psychologically and mentally and, and wouldn't be for the good of the entire family. And so maybe we just need to take a little bit of time right now and make sure we're giving mom a little more free time and, and then and see where things are at in a couple of months. But I think if the disposition of the hearts are in the right place and people have a, a real prayer life where they're actually listening to God, if they kind of reach an impasse where they're like, I don't know, what do you think, honey? I don't know. Or one says yes and the other is thinking no. I think that's when it's good to get a third party involved of like, you know, hey, Father, you know, could we meet you for a session of spiritual, you know, direction on this topic? And ultimately, the spiritual director's job is not to be a referee and like pick a winner and a loser. A good spiritual director punts it back to you, but gives you the tools of discernment. Because if you give it to the spiritual director and he says, no, nope, you know, the husband's right, the wife is wrong. And then things kind of get bad, or maybe it wasn't the best decision down the road. Then it's like, well, father told us to do it. It's like, no. When, when John Paul II you go, used to go on these wilderness backpacking, you know, hikes with the young adults, you know, they'd peel off with him for some one-on-one -on -one time and ask him their questions on their vocations and different relationship struggles. And they said he'd always kind of end these conversations with one phrase, which is, you must decide. He would always kick it back to them. So let me just give you the tools of discernment and then let you make that choice and own that choice by the gift of your own free will. And that way, good or bad, you can't just look back at the priest and say, well, you told me to do this, Father. And so, uh, yeah, if you need to, get a third party involved. And hopefully if that priest you know, is a good spiritual director, they'll just really give you the tools of discernment to listen not only to God, but to each other. Because sometimes, you know, I've heard of couples where they've been using NFP for a while, and then they kind of sit down and have a conversation about, you know, more kids and the wife was like, well, well, I thought we were like not having a pregnancy right now because like financially you're stressed out. And he's like, well, no, no, we're, we're in a good place right now. I thought we were not, I thought we were using NFP because you and you were kind of all stressed out and burnt out with a little kid. And she's like, well, no, he's sleeping through the night now and things are in a different place. So sometimes with some good, healthy spousal communication, you know, some of those uh, misunderstandings could be resolved. But yeah, the d default position is really openness towards life. Not like if you're a good Catholic, you use NFP, and if you're bad Catholic, you use contraception. No, good children realize, good parents realize that children are the supreme gift of marriage. The default position is always openness to life, unless you're prayerfully discerning. You know, now's really not the right time. Uh, it's not the this attitude of you. Well, you're done, right? I mean, I've lost count of how many people have asked us that question. Well, you've had two now, you've had three, now you've five, now you've eight, now you guys done. It's like no good Catholic thinks like that. We're done. You know, we've just kind of put a limit on God's grace. Whether it's like, okay, we've just discerned right now that now is not the time, uh, but God will tell us where we're at a week from now or a month from now or two years from now. We're always open to living in his will in the present moment. I do think there's a modern tendency for people not to consult their pastor or spiritual director, or I guess that ties into the the problem of people not getting spiritual directors mm -hmm. yeah and, and sometimes it's hard to get a spiritual director i mean i've lost count of how many priests i've asked hey father you know can can you be my spiritual director and like uh i'm sorry but i just can't i it's just not in their bandwidth i mean they might be doing 12 sick visits to the hospital and this and that and on this committee and that and that and, and they just can't necessarily take on a new spiritual directee but if you find a priest like you really really like and just every time you have an encounter with him it just leads you closer to god then Find out when he's doing confession and just always go to confession to him. And, you know, obviously got to be realistic that you're not trying to wedge spiritual direction into confession um, where you're realizing that the sacrament is not the sacrament of spiritual direction. But uh, if you're really getting a lot of fruit from being around him, then say, OK, well, he does Saturday afternoon at three o'clock every other weekend or whatever. Then just make that your time. And, uh, and you'll get some good spiritual gems in the midst of the, the time you have in confession with him. But don't try to turn it then into a 
private counseling session because that's not fair for everybody else in line or for him. Um, but yeah, sometimes the door closes on the desire you'd have for your particular spiritual director, but you can always still go to confession to him uh, and then maybe keep your eyes open for another spiritual director at a different parish uh, that might have a little bit more availability. Next question is from Captain Pants. What are your thoughts on long distance slash online dating and how to do it right slash virtuously? Yeah, well, I don't believe, uh, Captain Pants, uh, that uh, I don't believe in online dating. I believe in online meeting, um, meaning there's lots of good young adult Catholic singles who have just been frustrated about the quantity and quality of other young adult Catholic singles in their vicinity, and so they've taken advantage of the good stuff that's online, like uh, CatholicChemistry.com or AveMariaSingles.com, CatholicMatch.com, CatholicSingles.com, and uh, and they've been able to meet some hopefully good people on there. The challenge with those is that the bigger the site, you know, like Catholic Match, Catholic Singles, uh, you'll have more selection. Uh, but typically the pool is a bit more diverse in terms of the level of devotion of the people you might find there. Like some person might connect and be like, hey, I'm Catholic, oh, so am I. And then you ask, well, when was the last time I went to church? And he's like, oh, when I was baptized, you know, I think I was like two months old. Um, you know, whereas you go to some of the smaller sites, there might not be as many people, but there typically tends to be a higher level of um, median level of devotion among them. They tend to be a little bit more serious about their faith in some of the smaller dating sites. But I'm totally open to people trying those things. And I know good Catholic marriages that have happened from those things. Um, but then ultimately dating, though, needs to happen in person. And so if you meet this person, like, wow, this, this, this person is great. You know, where do they live? They're, they're in Dubai. Okay. Um, uh, any chance you might be able to move to anywhere near my zip code in the next presidency or so? And if there's really no founded hope that either one of you could move anytime in the near future after some period of getting to know each other, then you've got to be realistic about stirring up these romantic desires when they can't be truly fulfilled. Because that discernment, I really think, needs to be happening in person. Because we can be anybody we want, you know, online. I mean, you can be an avatar for all the other person knows. Um, but in person, you see each other's good times, the bad. Uh, how do they interact with your family? Are they a person of service, a person of patience? How do they handle rush hour traffic? Like, We've got to see them and they're, and they're good and they're bad as, as a part of the whole discernment process. And so long relation, distance relationships are a challenge. I mean, when I met Kristalina, we met in the Bahamas at a chastity conference out there. And then she moved back to Denver and I moved back to San Diego. And so we kind of just had a long distance friendship for, I'd say, like a year, a little over a year, year and a half. And then it kind of seemed like, okay, things are really kind of moving in this direction. So I couldn't move because the job I had in San Diego, but but she did have flexibility with her career and was able to pick up and move out to San Diego where we could kind of more discern in person. Um, and so I think you really want to make sure that if you do start something online, that there could be a possibility in the not too distant future, um, you know, of arranging some trips to see each other and then hopefully the trips go well and then a person could pick up camp and, and move over and think, okay, I think this is, uh, I think this might be the one I need to put my, all my chips in and uh, pick up and move and really give this a try. Because I think the most overlooked tool of discernment is action. Um, you know, they, they say ever since discernment became popular, nobody's made a decision. Um, but, but I think action of just like, okay, is this an apple seed or is this an orange seed? It is an apple seed or an orange seed. Maybe I should do an ovina to find out. Just put that thing in the ground and then see what sprouts <laughs> up in a couple months. Um, same thing with dating. Like, is this one or should I go to the seminary? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Just go to the seminary. You probably find out in a couple months, okay, this is not for me. Or like, wow, I'm so at peace here. Or uh, should I ask her out? Should I not ask her out? Should I ask her out? Did you ask her out? Um, go on a couple of dates, do what happens. Uh, a lot of times you can get an answer so much more quickly by just action, where a lot of times it's almost like we want to trust in God and then just sit back and wait for him to act. What I think what he oftentimes wants us to do is trust him but act and then let his providence play out. Um, and so I, I think he wants us to move. I think he wants us to be people of trust and action. Um, and so online dating, I'd say to give it a shot um, in terms of online meeting, um, then, then try to get it close so that you guys can discern the sacrament in person as opposed to virtually, uh, which can lead to a lot of 
overestimations of the person's quality. Uh, because Pope John Paul II, in uh, Love and Responsibility, he said early on in a romantic relationship, there's a tendency we have. And he said, some of us don't do this some of the time, all of us do it all the time. We enter a relationship kind of hoping for certain attributes or virtues for the other person to possess. And as soon as they exhibit the smallest degree of that particular virtue, we typically bestow upon them the fullness of that attribute beyond all reasonable bounds. So like, you hope the girl you're going to marry is going to be generous. Then you take her on a date and, you know, you leave the restaurant. She gives her leftovers to some homeless guy outside. And you're like, oh, I'm dating Mother Teresa. Like, dude, she's literally Mother Teresa. It's like, dude, no, she just gift like half-eaten lasagna to some guy outside. Okay, don't get – don't let's not blow this thing out of proportion. And so we've just got to temper – uh, I, I think our expectations and hopes in the person and the best way to do that is just spend in real time face to face in person for as long as possible. Next question is from what are you doing? Hello, Jason. What are some good examples of lives changed by following Catholic sexual ethics? Either married people when they go from closed off slash con contracepting to open to children or unmarried people going from sexually active to celibate? I'll give you uh, two examples, one of each. Uh, one, I remember uh, a woman who, she and her husband were not Catholic, they were contracepting, or maybe they were Catholic and they're contracepting, I don't recall, but they had a conversion. They're like, okay, got to throw away the contraceptives and went on NFP, started charting. And then uh, the husband looked at the wife's chart and he's like, ah, something doesn't look right here. You know, I don't think this should be happening at that time of the month. And so they went to the NFP coach or the doctor and like, uh, you know, my husband says the chart doesn't look right. And the doctor was like, well, your husband's actually right. Like the, the chart does not look right. Something's off. I think it may be something involving your thyroid. So I'd like you to I want to make an appointment for you today with the thyroid specialist. I want you to see them immediately because I'm kind of concerned. So they went to the thyroid specialist. I kind of took a look at her uh, and found out she actually had a cancerous tumor growing on her thyroid and they operated on her, I think it was the next day, and uh, removed the tumor and saved the woman's life. Had they been on contraception, she would probably be dead. Uh, because they never would have detected the tumor in time before it had spread. Um, and so she said it was almost like when we were living outside of the will of God. It's like we had this umbrella over our heads that was blocking so many of the graces that he wanted to give to us. But then when we took down that umbrella, we opened ourselves to receive, we were just showered all of these blessings that we were kind of withholding from ourselves. Um, in terms of uh, openness to chastity prior to marriage, I remember uh, traveling once in a um, Honduras and we're going through this jungle uh, on our way to a school and the person driving me said, oh, look down the road, there's a, a cloistered convent of poor Claire nuns. And I'm like, oh, can, can we go there real quick and just ask them to pray for the talks we're doing? And they're like, oh, good idea. We drove down there and the nuns kind of came out to the parlor to greet us. And it was kind of a funny side story. This elderly nun was there and she said, oh, you know, in Spanish, she's like, oh, Jason is here, you know, giving chastity talks. And um, and, uh, and the translator, yes, yes, yes. And she said, oh, um, give us a chastity talk. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> and then the nun sat down and I'm like, uh, I said to the translator, I'm like, dude, she's kidding, right? And she's like, no, 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 they want a chastity talk. I'm like, this is not happening. I'm like, this is like, this is like Donald Trump giving Pope Francis a poverty talk. Like th this is not happening in the right direction. But sure enough, they sat down, made, a, made me give him a talk. But one of the novices came to the, the grape there at the parlor, uh, the girl, and, um, and she said to the translator, she said, oh, please thank Jason. Um, and I'm like, thank me, like for what? Like, I don't, I don't know you, some nun in the middle of the jungle. And, um, and she said, apparently the CFR priests are missionaries down there. And he, he, she said that they came to her village and gave out our chastity books. And uh, apparently as a teenager, she read it and she realized she really needed to change her life and be more modest and st stop doing certain stuff. And, and she did. Uh, as partly a result of that book, she entered the religious life. And now she's this poor Claire nun uh, praying for us in the middle of the jungle in Honduras. And so, yeah, when, when the one key that I think uh, unlocks kind of a vault of limitless graces from God is trust. But if we distrust the heart of the Father, we withhold from ourselves so many of the blessings that he wants to bestow upon us. Amen. Next question is from Wizurf. I would like to hear your advice on how to move on from the guilt of past physical sin, even though, no one, know, even though one knows that God has already forgiven them. Yeah, well, one of the things I remember a priest saying is that, you know, God knows your sins, but he calls you by your name. The devil knows your name, but he calls you by your sins. And so 
really step back and think, okay, am I calling myself by my sins? Like you are that failure. You are that dirty person. You are that shameful, isolated, blah, blah. That's not the voice of the Holy Spirit. It isn't. And you need to rebuke that. And uh, you could spend time in some praise and worship uh, music or just some sacred music of just really trying to hear the voice of God speaking to you in terms of how he sees you and how he looks at you. Um, and kind of start to see your reflection in his eyes to know that, yeah, yeah, he, he was present in those moments in darkness. But, you know, he, he doesn't just sit there and, like, count all of your mistakes on some board. Like, oh, they messed up again. Oh, there, there she goes. There he goes. You know, yeah, God sees the, the losses, but he also sees the victories. And you've had a lot of those victories. But, like, you don't count those. It's It's like we have this neurotic scrupulous attitude of just like, oh, all he sees is the bad because that's all I see. It's like, no, no, no. He's not waiting at the finish line for you uh, and just watching you struggle and crawl along. And then eventually he's just going to applaud for you. Hey, you finally made it. You know, it's kind of a mess, but you're here. Like he's in the trenches with you, bleeding with you, uh, you know, just cheering you on. I mean, he's this life is possible because he lives in you by virtue of your baptism, that the, that the Trinity dwells in you. And so um, I remember one saint saying, anytime the devil reminds you of your past, just remind him of his future. It's like, whoa, mic drop. Uh, so the, the devil doesn't want you to live in your past or in the future. Like the, the devil doesn't want you in the present moment. So anything he can do to just get you out of the present moment and focus on regrets of the past or anxieties about the future, then he's in his zone. And so really start thinking, okay, where am I living right now? Am I spending a good amount of my imaginative faculties dwelling over the past or ruminating about anxieties about the future? If so, God's not to be found in either one of those places. He's only here right now, the eternal I am. And so pull yourself back in because once we kind of pile on ourselves yesterday plus tomorrow on top of today, you're crushed. And so push those off because today, you can handle. And if you can't handle today, look, are you getting enough sleep? Are you getting enough exercise? Are you eating right? Uh, get those th three things in order. Exercise, eat, sleep. And then look, okay, you know, all my problems didn't go away, but they feel a heck of a lot more manageable. And uh, instead of spending that hour on a screen, I spent it on a treadmill or, or CrossFit class or whatever. Like, the problems still exist, but they can become so much more manageable when we're living in the present moment and just taking care of the things that are within our control instead of the things that are easily within our control, like your sleep, your diet, your exercise. We're not even in control of that. When those things out of our control are just going to make it feel so much more impossible. That's why he literally commanded us, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Sufficient for a day is its own evil. Next question is from Maka. One thing that always confuses me is practicing chastity in marriage. Discussions about chastity always seem to revolve around the usage and difficulty of NFP. However, in my case, in the case of my husband and I, we are struggling to conceive, so NFP being difficult is, not, is just not our experience. How can we better understand practicing chastity in marriage when NFP isn't a cross? Yeah, you're you're right. When you know when Chastity and Marriage talked about, typically we go right to the contraception issue. Um, but there's other things involved. Think of what sex is. It's your wedding vows made flesh. So what were your vows? What were your promises? Um, is is that your love is free? It's total. It's faithful. You know, and it's ordered towards procreation or the giving of life. And so that last part for you is is your aim right now. You know, so it's not something that you're trying to avoid. Look at the other ones, you know, free, total, faithful, um, the fidelity of your imagination, of your heart, of your eyes, um, not only with pornography online and things like that, but when we're in public, um, when we're scrolling online, going on social media, is there fidelity there? Um, you know, is this gift free and total? like where you're holding nothing back from each other? Is it freely given, meaning free from any addiction? Because I try to point out that like for people who didn't really practice chastity prior to marriage, like imagine a guy who never overcame the habit of like porn or masturbation, then he gets married and he's not even really making love to his wife. Like he, he kind of is using his wife's body as an outlet for what he thinks of as his sexual needs and the woman's heart can perceive the difference. And so to maybe take a look at those four parts of the vow, vow free, total, faithful, fruitful, and be like, okay, are, there's, are there any of those that I could really 
you know, maybe work on a little bit. Um, and, and maybe during a time of the month that uh, you know that you can't get pregnant, but you, you could be intimate, you could be like, well, maybe we'll give up a time of physical intimacy during that time is a time of fasting together and a time of, of sacrifice that, you know, we have a time of feast um, in, in a sense that we're able to, you know, enjoy this closeness whenever we want, but maybe we can surrender a particular time of the month when we know we can't get pregnant, so we're not going to be missing an opportunity to conceive, but we could maybe offer up that little sacrifice sacrifice for uh, a prayer towards our fertility, a prayers for the sanctification of each other. And, th and this idea was from St. Paul that, you know, spouses should not be apart from each other except for a short amount of time for the sake of prayer. Um, and so that abstinence kind of be could offered up as, as a form of prayer. Um, but yeah, th th spend some time, you know, ruminating on the free, total, faithful, fruitful, and how you could apply that. If you want a deeper dive into chastity and marriage, you could check out Christopher West's book, Good News About Sex and Marriage. Uh, I think it was published by Ascension maybe uh, years ago, but really, really good book by Christopher West. So we're about at the 30 minute mark. We can keep going if you'd like, or we can end it here. Sure, we can take another one. All right. Uh, next question is from Melon. Do you have any thoughts slash advice for men discerning religious life as a monk or friar? Um, one I would say is what we'd mentioned earlier is action. Like go do like a come and see weekend. Um, go and give it a shot and, and you know, look around like, okay, what, what are my, what are my desires? You know, what, cause I think God speaks to us through the desires he gives us. And it's like, you know, well, I want to live a life of, you know, real contemplation and asceticism or like, no, I really feel called to study and scholarship and teaching. Okay. Well, maybe the Dominicans are for you or Jesuits or whatever. Well, no, I feel like more poverty service. Okay. Maybe the Franciscans are where God's calling you to. And, um, do I, is it more active, more contemplative kind of find where you think your sweet spot is and then go give it a shot, you know, say, you know, I want to, you know, spend a, a week of discernment with the friars and Hey, that'd be great. Now I was just over in Oakland, California recently. And, uh, uh, we had some time before my talk. And so we hopped over to the, uh, Franciscan friars of the renewal house there, you know, in a real rough part of town where they like to be in Oakland and, you know, just spend some time with morning prayer mass and breakfast with the friars. And it was just a, it's a beautiful experience spending time with the guys and seeing how they live and how they fellowship and, you know, what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. That type of experience is irreplaceable in the discernment process. You can't get that out of a book. You just got to go put yourself in there and say, like, can I see myself here uh, for the rest of my life? And, um, you know, and, and to know also that if you are called to the priesthood of religious life, it doesn't mean that you're not going to feel a tug toward the married life. I remember Mother Angelica was walking around uh, the monastery with some young seminarians, and she said, I just want to let you guys know that if you don't want to be a husband and a father, then we don't want you here in the seminary. I was like, wait, if you wait, if we don't want to be a husband and father, you don't want us in the seminary. And she said, exactly, because like, what kind of priest would you make if you didn't have that spousal heart, that desire of a father to lay down his life for his children? Like if that heart isn't in you, I mean, you're just not going to make a good priest. And so I think any good Catholic is going to feel a bit of a tug towards both vocations. You know, even a married guy, we're like, wow, you know, it would be neat to serve the church that way as a priest and hear confessions and, you know, homilies and help people. Like, I, I realize the good of that. Um, but is that desire really in your heart? Because God isn't, doesn't want to make you a prisoner out of you. He's not looking for like inmates of the interior life. Uh, so don't come to the conclusion that like, oh, you're just a, you know, a, a half-baked, you know, lukewarm Catholic if you don't join the priesthood, that you're giving God kind of your sloppy seconds because you're not giving him, you know, your life as a priest first. Like, that can be guilting yourself into a false vocation because, I remember one saint said that, I think it was Padre Pio, that like, in a reference, I think he was speaking to, of, of marriage, but it applies to the priesthood, that God calls some people to marriage, some people call themselves to marriage, and the devil calls some people to marriage. Uh, and the same would be true of the priesthood, that, that sometimes we can be guilting ourselves into a false vocation, sometimes we can have an authentic vocation, but we're running away from it out of fear and distrust. Um, but I think the best way is just kind of go and see like, okay, I'm, I'm really at peace here. Like this isn't as bad as I thought was afraid it would be, or, you know, I really gave this my best shot and I'm just not at peace here. Like I just don't see this. And then a lot of times people leave the seminary, enter the married life with just such peace of heart of knowing like, you know what, I gave it my all. And it was very clear, not only to me, but my spiritual director there, that this is not the path God was calling me to. 
And, you know, I've got friends that that's their story. And, and these guys typically make great husbands and fathers because they've got a, a good deal of spiritual formation under their belt of daily prayer in the seminary. And then they can apply that to their domestic church as the domestic priest there as a husband and a father. Uh, I know, you know, Jackie Francois Angel, many of you are familiar with her story, perhaps, where she dated a guy and then he discerned into the priesthood. Then she dated another guy and he broke up with her because he discerned he's going to the priesthood. Then she dated another guy and he discerned and went into the priesthood. And she's like, okay, God, uh, what is going on? And then she met her husband, Bobby, who had just left the seminary and discerned it wasn't his calling and they got married. And Jackie's like, okay, that's fair. I get one God, you get three. That's a good deal. Um, and so just, just be, be open uh, to knowing that it's not the final answer necessarily. I mean, most college students, when they get to college, change their major three different times. And so it's not a bad thing to go to the seminary and decide it's not for you. It's not even a bad thing to get married and, or and get engaged and then realize, uh, this is a bad idea and call it off. In fact, I knew of a Protestant marriage prep program where they gauge the success of their program based on how many couples they could get to call off the engagement. And they got about 50% of the engagements to get called off. And that's a huge win because I think those would have ended up as divorces or annulments down the road anyway. And so the, the, the point of the whole thing is like, don't be afraid to just give it a try. And then if you really get a sense in your heart, this is not the way to go, then you'll have peace moving, you know, in this direction or that. But don't just don't just get paralysis by analysis. We're just kind of, you're just kind of sitting back waiting for a lightning bolt. God typically doesn't work that way. Don't don't use a novena. I, I think novenas are not a substitute for authentic discernment. They're a great gift in the church. And if you want to do a novena for for, for wisdom, for courage, for faith, you know, go for it. But if you're looking for a God, tell me in nine days if she's the one, you know, God, give me nine days to know if I should get ordained or not. God typically doesn't work on our timetable. Uh, you know, we need to kind of more focus on his, his timetable, which is just one day at a time. Amen. All right. Uh, do you want to end with one last question? Sure. Okay. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead to Father Baggins' question. So Father Baggins is the server chaplain. He's a real priest. Okay. Um, he asks, I'm a parish priest and pastor out in the real world, and I was wondering if you could give one piece of advice to any priest in regards to teaching and supporting an authentic view of sexuality and the human person, what would you tell him? I'm especially interested in how you would encourage him to relate this to teens and young adults. Thank you again. Um, you know, one, one thing that we mentioned earlier, I'll, I'll give just two thoughts. One is that quote from John Paul II, where he said, chastity can only be thought of in association with the virtue of love. Um, we have to make this clear in their minds that the whole point of chastity is not to avoid unwanted pregnancy and STDs and all that stuff. I mean, the point of chastity is to free you to love, to free you to know if you're being loved. Those are the functions of this virtue because young people, I mean, their hearts are made for love. Their minds are made for the truth. Chastity gives them both. But if they just see, simply see it as a litany of rules and regulations and restrictions, it's like, okay, well, what's in this for me? They need to understand that if I don't obtain self-mastery, I can't really make a gift of myself and love. And, you know, from the girl's perspective, chastity really helps her to know, does this guy love me or does he just love the pleasure he's getting from me? Because, yeah, he makes you feel wanted, but he might want you like a smoker, quote unquote, wants a cigarette. They don't want a cigarette. I mean, smokers want the feeling to get from the nicotine in the cigarette. And then it's when it's smoked down, you can see how much they value the cigarette by how much they just flick it into the ashtray or the gutter. Because the cigarette's not what they wanted. The pleasure is what they wanted. And the woman, you know, is the necessary piece of apparatus for the guy. And so I think uh, tying in chastity to love, super important. Um, but then in terms of one piece of advice is just live out your own vocation as a priest with that virtue of chastity. I know when I'm around husbands or fathers or priests that are really growing in virtue, they don't need to say much. It's it's not so much what they say, it's just who they are. There's this, this bravitas, this kind of weight to them because of how they take their interior life seriously that's really attractive to another guy of just like, dude, that guy's living it. That guy's walking the walk. And it could just be the smallest passing conversation. So they just say something that didn't, they didn't even tend to be profound, but you end up just kind of sitting on it for a while and be like, dude, that guy's the real deal. He, he's, I mean, I, I got to see Pope John Paul II 24 times in my life. And uh, just being around the guy, it was like better than a homily. Just, just seeing him, he had a magnetism about him because of the weight of his interior life. And so I think of, 
what God the Father says in the New Testament. There's only one command he gives in the whole New Testament. Old Testament, lots of commands. New Testament, only one command by the Father, and that's, this is my beloved son, listen to him. So I think when we're spending time listening to the beloved son, spending time in adoration, especially renewing that commitment here in Lent, um, he speaks to us. We listen to him, we follow him, and that example, I think, is uh, more winsome than anything else that we could possibly say. Amen. All right, that is all the questions we have time for. Uh, thank you to everyone who submitted a question, and thank you to Jason for answering these questions. Uh, before uh, I end here with a prayer, I'm going to give Jason an opportunity to uh, plug his content in social media, and we'll also include it in the uh, uploaded video in the description. Yeah, so uh, we've got a lot of places you can get a hold of us. One is chastity.com, which is our website. Um, and if you go to chastity.com, you're able to connect with us um, through social media. Our Instagram is just Jason Ebert. Uh, Twitter is just Jason Ebert. Um, uh, we've got TikTok. Uh, it's like it's like Jason dot Ebert. Um, but just go to chastity.com and connect with us there. We have a podcast called Lust Is Boring, and uh, we release about every week and a half, two weeks, a new episode. The one we're about, the last one we did was on singleness, uh, but the next one we're going to release. I'm excited about is an interview I did with Chloe Cole, who's a detransitioner and an activist who uh, went gender reassignment surgery and everything back at the age of 15, then realized, okay, this is not best choice. And now she's testified before Congress and she's done so many amazing things to, to, to help young people. So I spent about two hours sitting and interviewing Chloe Cole and uh, it was just a fantastic interview. So we'll be um, getting that one out um, probably a week, week and a half um, through the, uh, the podcast Lust is Boring. Amen. All right, guys, uh, let's end with a prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O God, I wish to thank Thee for giving us the gift of being able to hear Jason Everett here today. I pray that all who have heard this AMA are able to derive some benefit from it, and I ask that Thou bless all those who worked hard to make it happen, especially Jason himself. I ask this through Jesus Christ, Thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with Thee, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.